Hi everyone, I'm Dennis, welcome to The Bindery. This video series is all about getting started in bookbinding, beginning from page one. If you missed the first installment, in which I shared my recommendations for the basic tools, just click the link above. This video is chapter two, in which I'll discuss the basic materials you'll need to get started. At the end of the video, I'll show you how to make your first notebook, and if you want to skip right to the tutorial, just click the timestamp in the description below. Let's get started. It should come as no surprise that the most important, and maybe the most confusing, material in bookbinding is paper. The selection of thicknesses, textures, colors, and even the composition of paper today can be completely overwhelming. But you don't need a degree in paperology, I totally made that up, to start making your own books. For your first bookbinding projects, you'll want to start simply and use paper that's both readily available and affordable. For most of us, that means either printer paper or sketching paper, and either of those are a fine choice for your first notebooks. On any commercially made paper's packaging, you'll usually find a number of different terms, but what do they all mean? The first thing you'll usually see will be the paper type, which generally describes its intended use, whether that be general office printing, presentations or flyers, or for art papers, the type of media they're best suited to. Next thing are the dimensions, being the length and width of the paper in either imperial, metric, or sometimes both. Also prominent will be the paper weight, which is one of those confusing things I mentioned, which I'll discuss in a bit. Other common features you might find are things like composition, color, or texture. Very rarely, if ever, is the grain direction indicated on mainstream papers, so I'll deal with that separately. For now, I'll start with those elements of greatest concern for a beginner bookbinder, and those are dimensions and weight. Paper comes in a wide array of dimensions, but odds are your most readily available size will be that of common printer paper. In North America, that means letter size, being 8.5 inches by 11 inches. Elsewhere in the world, A4 size is predominant, which is 210 millimeters by 297 millimeters. Either of these paper sizes will work just fine for small notebooks. But remember that for the types of sewn bindings I'll be showing you, your paper will need to be folded one or more times. So if you have a particular size book in mind, make sure you start with paper at least twice the size of the finished book. You can often find double-sized versions of common printer papers, being either 11 by 17 inches or metric A3 size. These can be useful for reasons I'll discuss shortly. Sketch pads, which can be found in a wide range of sizes, are also a great source for large format paper, or you may be able to find full-size sheets at an art store or paper supplier. When it comes to understanding paper weight, no, not that kind of paper weight. When it comes to understanding paper weight, I could do an entire video on the topic, for now, I'll keep it super simple and talk about paper weights that are useful for bookbinding, starting with paper for the pages of your book. The kind of general everyday printer paper that we're all familiar with is usually called 20 pound paper. It's called this because 500 sheets of the uncut full size paper weighs 20 pounds. 20 pound paper is easy to work with and is just fine for everyday jotters or casual notebooks. 24 pound paper is often marketed for presentations, resumes, or flyers, where the impression of a more quality feel is important. Drawing paper weight is also measured in pounds, though at face value this is very misleading, so you need to be careful. A 50 pound drawing paper, for example, is actually quite lightweight, very much like a 20 pound printer paper. This is because the pound weight is not based on the thickness, but the weight of 500 full uncut sheets. Printer paper might be about 17 inches by 22 inches when it comes out of the paper mill. 500 sheets of this full uncut paper weighs 20 pounds. Drawing paper, on the other hand, comes in a much larger size from the factory, perhaps 24 inches by 36 inches. Even though this paper is about the same thickness as the printer paper, 500 sheets of it weigh a lot more, about 50 pounds. This difference in the basis size of the full sheets is what accounts for the difference in the nomenclature. If all this sounds really complicated to you, don't worry. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. In general, printer or writing paper from 20 to 28 pounds, or drawing paper from 50 to 120 pounds, will work well for the pages of your book. Though, there are some exceptions. But don't worry, there is a light at the end of this archaic imperial system tunnel, and it's called metric. I prefer to rely on the metric paperweight system, often noted as GSM, GM2, or simply G, and in a moment I think you will too. GSM stands for grams per square meter of a single piece of paper, no matter the type. You can get a quick idea of the relative thickness of a paper, whether it's lightweight bond paper, 60 GSM, bulk standard copy paper, 70 to 75 GSM, everyday sketch paper, 80 GSM, premium writing paper, 90 GSM, thick multimedia paper, 160 GSM, or watercolor paper, 185 GSM and up. In general, papers in the 70 to 90 GSM range are a good choice for the text block of your book. See, that's not that hard. 
For the simple notebooks I'll be showing you how to make later, a second type of stronger paper will be needed for the covers. This is where you can have a bit of fun and add a splash of color or design to your notebooks. Often called cardstock or cover stock, these papers are stiffer than sketch or copy paper and heavier, usually in the 150 to 250 GSM range. These can often be found in a variety of colors or patterns as well. Or if you prefer, choose a plain heavy paper for your cover and decorate it yourself. Paper grain. No matter the weight, size, or type of paper you choose, chances are it will be industrially made by machines and therefore will have a grain direction. This happens when the individual fibers of paper pulp get lined up as they are pulled through the paper making machinery. The resulting structure of the finished paper is slightly weaker and more flexible in one direction, stronger and stiffer in the other. This is what we call paper grain. Once the paper is cut to size, grain direction is referred to as either long or short. Long grain is when the fibers are parallel to the long edge of the paper, and most standard copy paper is long grain. Short grain then refers to when the fibers align with the short side of the paper. A long grain paper can be made into two short grain papers simply by cutting it in half. This is a handy trick if you would like to print the contents of your book for folding and sewing, but you can't find short grain letter or A4 paper. Double sized papers like A3 or 11 by 17 are most often long grain, but when cut in half will yield two reams of short grain printer paper. You can ask at your local copy center if they offer guillotine cutting if you don't fancy cutting down 500 sheets by hand. So now we know what paper grain is, but why is it important? Simply put, it is almost always preferable to go with the grain in bookbinding, especially if moisture is involved. Paper will expand opposite the grain direction. This is why paper ripples or curls when wet. Keeping the grain aligned parallel to the book's spine will help minimize any rippling or warping caused by the number one source of moisture, which is glue. And even in non-glued bindings, keeping the grain running from head to tail will make folding the signatures easier and will assist in the pages turning and draping properly. So I mentioned that grain direction is often not indicated when you buy paper. Luckily, grain direction is easy to figure out. Here are my two favorite methods. The first is simple. Take a single piece of your paper, and gently bend it in one direction until you feel a little resistance. Pay attention to how tight of a bend is made. Then turn the paper 90 degrees and bend it in the opposite direction. Try to apply the same amount of force and gauge both the resistance you feel and the tightness of the bend. Go back and forth a few times to compare. One direction may feel significantly more flexible and have a tighter bend than the other. If so, the more flexible orientation indicates the paper's grain direction. If this test is inconclusive, which is often the case with lighter weight papers, try this trick. Using your knife or a pair of scissors, make two cuts at the corner of your paper, one in each direction. Then, using a bit of water, moisten each of the strips on one side. Immediately, you should see one strip curl up while the other will stay more or less straight. The straight strip indicates the paper's grain direction. If neither of your test strips show any significant movement, your paper probably doesn't have a strong grain direction at all which is possible and actually common with handmade papers. That's good news because you can use that paper in whatever orientation is best for you. Once you know your paper's grain direction, it's helpful to record it and any other information on the test sheet itself, which you can then keep for future reference. The second key material to consider for book binding is thread. Every sewn binding from a simple pamphlet to a huge tome will require some sort of cordage to hold everything together. In traditional Western bookbinding, the go-to thread has long been linen. Woven from natural fibers derived from the stems of flax plants, linen thread is strong and durable, knots easily and reliably, and has a proven record for being safe for books. Linen thread is available in a variety of gauges or thicknesses, usually described by two numbers separated by a slash. For an all-purpose thread, I'd recommend an 18-3 linen, which has a nominal thickness of about half a millimeter and will work for a wide variety of books. But not all books need the strength and archival qualities of linen. Cotton is another viable material, and what's more, it's readily available in a wide variety of colors. You might consider embroidery floss or synthetic fibers, especially if you are intrigued by the many types of decorative exposed sewing. I've even seen yarn or dental floss used to sew books, so in this regard your options are wide open. My third material in the beginner's lineup is not strictly necessary, but it can be beneficial. Wax has a few uses in the bindery that make other operations go more smoothly, and I mean that quite literally. I most often use wax on my sewing thread. Wax thread is in general easier to work with than non-wax thread. It aids in attaching the needle, helps to prevent twists and kinks in the thread as you sew, and reduces friction as you're pulling the thread through the paper. Pre-wax thread is commonly available, though I find it to be too heavily waxed for bookbinding. I prefer to wax my own thread as needed 
as I'm sewing. Any type of wax will work for this. I usually use natural beeswax, though paraffin is equally appropriate and is cheaper and more readily available. Pretty much any everyday candle will provide enough wax for many spools of thread. Now that we've assembled our toolkit and understand the materials, I think it's time we finally make a book. I'm going to keep it really simple for now, but I'll show you some variations at the end which will help you give your notebook a personal touch. What I'm going to show you is called a pamphlet binding. It's made up of just a few sheets of paper, folded in half and sewn along the fold with a piece of heavier paper for the cover. Because the sewing is exposed on the outside, a thread with a complementary colour is a nice touch. This structure will introduce you to the basic operations of cutting, folding, piercing, sewing, and trimming your book. For this project you'll need some paper for your pages. Here I'm using some 80 GSM long grain writing paper in a nice cream colour. I've got four sheets, which when cut in half and folded will make a 32 page notebook. For the cover, I've chosen this nifty patterned cover stock, I think it's about 120 GSM. I'll be using some coloured linen thread, which is 18.3 gauge, and a bit of beeswax to coat it. I've got my tools all ready, being a steel ruler, utility knife, folder, awl, and a sewing needle. While not strictly necessary, I'm going to add a couple of small binders clips. I'll also be using a piece of regular old corrugated cardboard, oh, and a paperback book. Does that count as a tool? I'll show you what I'll do with it later, so you can decide then. And finally, if you have one handy, feel free to save your work surface and use some sort of a cutting mat. To start I want to take my four sheets of paper and cut them in half. This paper is long grain, and if you remember, it's best to keep the grain of the paper parallel with the spine of the book. I could make a really tall, skinny notebook, which is just fine if that's what you're going for, but this will be more of a standard pocket notebook, so I do need to cut this paper. To cut my sheets, I'll need to find the exact middle. I could measure for this, but here's a trick to cut your sheets precisely in half without measuring. Take one sheet and carefully fold it in half, top to bottom, making sure the outer corners line up perfectly. Flatten the crease with your folder. Next, lay the folded sheet on top of the others with the fold in the middle. Line up the edges carefully. If you have some binders clips, they can help keep things from slipping. Place your ruler along the fold. Hold the ruler down firmly with one hand, then make several light passes with your utility knife. Once you've cut through, open up your guide sheet, slide the ruler into the fold, then cut it in half as well. Now you should have twice as many sheets of half the size, but more importantly, the smaller sheets are now short grain instead of long. It's magic. Next we'll cut a piece of cardstock for our cover. This piece should be short grain as well. I'll use one of the pages I just cut as a template to cut out my cover and I'll leave a little extra width, perhaps about five millimeters. That's all the paper sorted, so it's time to fold the pages. Folding these all together is not only faster, but allows the pages to lay more closely together at the fold. Square up all of your papers and fold them over, making a crease first with your fingers, and then more firmly with your folder. The result is what is called a section or signature, terms you'll probably hear me use in the future. Sometimes the front edge of your signature will come out a bit lopsided, which is especially noticeable in signatures with a lot of pages. This is fine if the fore edge of the book will be trimmed, but if you'd rather not trim the book, there is a way to fold your signatures to have a symmetrical fore edge. Square up your papers as before. This time, firmly grip all of the sheets together at one side. While keeping the pages pinched firmly, bring that side up and over to be even with the opposite edge. This action can be repeated if necessary to move the paper enough. Bend the pages over, align them perfectly with the opposite edge, and make a crease. If it looks good, go ahead and firm it down with your folder. I know that sounds complicated, but with practice it gets much faster and creates an attractive front edge, especially in multi-signature books. We now need to add the cover to our notebook before piercing the holes. Take your cover stock and fold it in half, but don't crease it down just yet. Give it a slight bend, just enough to nestle the spine of your folded signature into. With the signature in place, you can firm up the crease with your folder. This method will help ensure that your cover will line up evenly at the fore edge, and it also reduces stress on the cover stock around the bend, which can help prevent cracking. Now is also a good time to attach your binder clips if you have them. There are a couple of ways to lay out your sewing hole pattern. Cut a bit of scrap paper the same height as your book and lay out your sewing holes with a ruler. I'm going to be using a five hole sewing pattern here, though any odd number of holes will work provided you have the space. This guide can then be held by hand as you pierce your holes, clipped in place, or you can use the DAS bookbinding method of making a hooked card to help keep everything aligned to the head of your book. 
To pierce the sewing holes, I'm going to use my awl and my bit of cardboard. Hold the awl at a 45 degree angle and push down firmly through the pages and the cover. For a more casual approach, I like to simply pierce the first hole roughly by eye in the middle of the book. Next, I pierce the holes at the head and tail, also just by eyeballing the distance in from the edges. Finally, I judge the gap between the end holes and the middle, again just by eye. So long as your holes aren't out by miles, any inaccuracies are almost imperceptible. And if anyone does perceive them, just say it's by design. You know, artistic license and all that. Time for sewing. You'll need a piece of thread that is a generous three times the height of your book. It's better to err on the longer side here, as coming up short is a pain. If your thread is very thin, then double the length, about six times the height of your book. Pass the thread between your thumb and a bit of wax a few times to both stiffen it and add a bit of lubrication. If your thread has some obvious twists or kinks, pulling it between your thumbnail and finger after waxing will help smooth those out. Next, thread your needle, which is often easier said than done. If your thread is very thin and you doubled the length, tie the ends together so the needle comes to rest in the middle. With a heavier thread like the linen I'm using here, I just pull about three times the needle's length of thread through the eye, then push the needle right through the thread at the shorter end. Pulling this down past the eye makes a knot that's both slim and secure. You can begin your sewing either on the inside or outside of your book, depending on where you want the knot to be. Begin at the middle sewing station and pull the thread through, leaving enough thread to tie a knot later. Next, guide the needle back through an adjacent hole. Left or right, it doesn't matter. Proceed to sew through the third hole at the end of the book. Here's a good time to make sure your initial sewing is snug by pulling on the thread from either end. Now reverse direction and pass the needle back through the previous hole from the opposite side. If you're using a sharp needle, take care not to pierce the existing thread. Then pull the thread snug. Here's the only slightly tricky bit of the sewing. Rather than going through the middle hole where you began, skip that one and go to the next one instead. Follow the same in and out pattern now until you reach the hole at the opposite end, then reverse direction for another stitch. You should now be left at the middle sewing station on the opposite side of the book from where you began. Pass the needle through the middle sewing station and check for any loose spots in your sewing. If everything looks good, then tie off your thread. I like to use a square knot, but any knot that won't slip will do. Trim the thread close to the knot, and the sewing is now complete. At this stage it's helpful to use your folder to recrease the spine of your book. The thickness of the thread, even a single strand, will tend to make it spring open a bit. Folding it down forces the thread slightly into the paper and reduces that spring back. At this point your loose sheets of paper are now officially a book, but chances are the edges could use a little refining. Luckily you have all the tools you'll need to do that, especially if you've got the paperback book I mentioned earlier. I'm going to begin by trimming the top and bottom, which in bookbinding terms are called the head and tail. I want the cuts to be as close to a perfect 90 degrees to the spine as I can get them, and that's hard to work out with just a ruler. A square, of course, is the perfect tool for this, either a plastic one or a carpenter's square like this. But I didn't list any of those in my required tools, so here's a little trick to achieve the same thing. But whatever method you choose, first make sure your knife is sharp by snapping off a section of the blade. To trim your notebook without a square, find a paperback book, preferably a fairly new one with a square back and even pages. Line your handmade notebook spine up with that of the paperback but let the end you want to trim extend out a little bit on one side. Then take your ruler and line it up with the end of the paperback. That store-bought book was trimmed on an industrial guillotine and I guarantee that it will be a 90 degree angle. Make sure that the two book spines are tight together and the ruler is snug to the paperback. Then hold the ruler down firmly on your notebook. With the blade held straight up and down, make smooth, light passes with your knife to trim first the cover stock, then the interior pages. Try not to alter the angle of your blade once you've started. Continue until you cut through the lower cover. Check that you're happy with the cut, then flip your notebook over and trim the other end. To trim the foredge, I actually prefer to measure the final cut rather than use a square. 
I determine where I want to trim the foredge, then measure out from the spine at the head and tail, making a small cut with my blade at each end to mark the location. Then it's just a matter of positioning the ruler and making the final cuts. And with that, the notebook is finished. So congratulations, you've made your first book. This type of single signature pamphlet is versatile enough to lend itself to endless variations, either in size, shape, or materials. Try using large format paper to make an easy to use lay flat sketchbook, or maybe uncut letter paper to make a tall ledger. You can alter the number or spacing of your sewing stations to creative effect. However you choose to create, I hope you have as much fun doing it as I've had showing you how. In the next video of this series, we'll be building upon what we've learned today to graduate from a single section notebook to a more full size book, a multi-signature binding that has a bit more heft, but is still an easy beginner project. I hope you'll join me for that, so be sure to subscribe and click the bell to turn on your notifications if you haven't already done so. If you're new to the channel, please feel free to have a look around and maybe check out some of my past projects like these. If you'd like to support me directly, then the easiest way to do that is to simply buy me a coffee. You'll find a link for that in the video description. Until next time, I'm Dennis, thanks for watching, and happy binding.